Stanford University. Both the U.S. and the Japanese send out expeditions to Antarctica <coughs> to look for meteorites. And the way they find them, they've learned a long time ago that there's, there are these blue ice fields where the ice is actually blue. And it is in these blue fields that rocks that were trapped in the ice by whatever means are brought up to the surface and then the wind and sublimation uh, remove some of the ice, leaving these rocks behind. So every year, if you go to a blue ice field, even the one that you, you went to last year, you will find new rocks. And, and the way you find them is just look around and any black object, you can see these sometimes from um, um, up to a kilometer away, any black object is, is likely a rock and most of them are meteorites. There, there are many there are some rocks that come from mountains and so forth, but uh, each year the U.S. brings back uh, hundreds of these, uh, typically close to a thousand, and the Japanese the same way. Well, a very small percentage percentage of those are Mars meteorites, uh, usually well under one percent, but there are enough to make it worthwhile, and there are a lot of people that study the other kinds of meteorites. And the meteorites uh, all come back to Houston, where they're roughly described, and, and uh, many of them are uh, chipped a little bit so you can make thin sections and see what they are. And then most of them are sent to uh, the Smithsonian, where they all U.S. meteorites officially belong to the Smithsonian. Um, the Mars ones we tend to keep in Houston because we, we have these clean cabinets and we're set up to process them. Uh, the Japanese do a similar thing, and they have, uh, their, their, their expeditions are sponsored by the Polar Research, uh, Institute of Polar Research, and they bring back the meteorites and keep them in, in uh, cabinets there in the Polar Institute. Okay, there we go. Uh, my, the point I want to make with this slide is that we have a a nice team that has been working this problem for now uh, about 12 years, and it's not just me, it's a whole team of people, and uh, including uh, even even the company is helping us. In 96, there was a uh, big press announcement that some of you may even remember, uh, in which we announced our findings uh, at, at, in Washington, and indeed that was a terrible circus with uh, hundreds of uh, uh, cameras and lots of questions and uh, uh, the head of NASA and a few skeptics like Bill Shop, and uh, I'm not sure we ever recovered from that. It, it was a big news event and it was clearly uh, something that got into the, uh, the media in a big way and that was not really our intent, but that's what happened. And the, the point of this is that the press blew it up much more than what we had actually said in the paper. If you read the paper, it was fairly conservative. And uh, the press uh, is not used to gray. They like black and white areas, so that's what happened. And we, we got accused of, uh, of pumping up the NASA budget uh, which is what this shows. And indeed, although that was not our intent, that's what happened. The NASA budget got a pretty good infusion because of this paper and all the publicity with it. And in fact, the whole Mars program uh, got an infusion of money that has continued to this day. And the whole Astrobiology Institute was started as a result of this paper. And uh, so this course uh, has, can trace probably a lineage to, to this paper. Right or wrong, it, it, it put a big uh, bump in the, in the uh, science of, of uh, life on Mars. Uh, all right, on to the technical aspects of it. Uh, we really had four arguments in that paper, uh, which are given here. There, there were these carbonates, and we argued they were formed at low temperatures 
possibly with the assistance of microbes. There were possible microfossils, what, what we now call biomorphs, things that look like uh, remain like uh, some trace of life. Uh, there were poly uh, aromic uh, hydrocarbons or paws, uh, and uh, we, t we found those with the lab of Dick Zare here in, at Stanford, and uh, we we found that they were closely associated with those carbonates. I'll say a bit more about that later. And then we found this tiny, these little tiny magnetite grains, nanophase uh, magnetites, uh, and it was noticed that by our team that they were very similar to magnetites known to be formed by a certain kind of bacteria, uh, magnetotactic bacteria, which had been known for about this had been known for about 20 years before our paper, that there are bacteria that produce in their bodies uh, these little magnetites which are used like compasses and are used to navigate and find the optimum environment that those bacteria thrive in, which happens to be uh, where the reducing, oxidizing uh, chemistry is, is such that they can make a living off those uh, oxidation reduction reactions. And uh, we argued that this suite of features taken together provided uh, possible evidence for uh, biology on Mars, ancient life on Mars. Now, we also said that, that not a sing <laughs> there was no single feature that was definitive for biology, uh, or conversely, we argued then and, and do today that if some of these features can be formed by non-biologic uh, methods, that does not invalidate the, our hypothesis. The hypothesis will still stand unless you can prove that all these features did form by non-biological processes. Um, and we had a lot of uh, supporters in the science community and a lot of detractors who propose, uh, and uh, the main uh, argument against it, as, as we'll see, has been by a, a series of uh, uh, research groups that have argued that the magnetites can be formed by non-biologic methods. Now, if you think about what I just said, does that invalidate our hypothesis even if true? And the answer is no. It's just an alternate explanation for the magnetites. Uh, but it does weaken our argument that these uh, features are supportive of, of biology. So we'll get into that in a little bit more. Uh, there were some very early objections to our hypothesis. Uh, the meteorite was probably contaminated in Antarctica. This was found in Antarctica, and maybe the carbonates precipitated and grew there, and maybe the, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons were really uh, dissolved in the meltwater and precipitated out on the carbonates, and that's why they're there. And maybe the magnetites were from either wind blowing dust or from yet undiscovered uh, magnetotactic bacteria that lived in Antarctica and got into the meteorite uh, from the environment. Uh, another argument against, against us was that uh, the magnetotactic bacteria that, that we didn't specifically um, say this, but uh, since Mars, at the time we wrote that paper, was thought to have no magnetic field at all, why would magnetotactic bacteria bother to develop on Mars by evolution? There's no, there's no forcing environment there. Well, two years after we published the paper, uh, in fact, some very strong magnetic regions were found uh, embedded in the rocks on Mars, and, and the magne magnetic uh, experts uh, pushed those back to say that meant that Mars had to have a strong uh, dynamo just as the Earth does, only probably stronger in the early days, 
and that dynamo uh, stopped at some time, but it left its imprint in the rocks. So in a way, uh, the presence of magnetotactic bacteria magnetite, if that's what they are, was a, was a clue that Mars had a magnetic field at one point, uh, although we certainly didn't know it at the time we wrote the paper. Uh, we were also uh, criticized uh, initially by uh, those that thought these carbonate globules formed at high temperatures. There are, in fact, uh, a number of carbonates that are, that are formed in volcanoes, for example, uh, by uh, igneous processes. Uh, there, we were criticized that the microfossils were coating artifacts and not real, and I'll get into that. The microfossils were too tiny to be real. That was another big criticism. And, and so we had our hands full at first looking at all these criticism uh, areas and either trying to answer them or conceding that, yeah, that's right. All right, I want to talk uh, briefly about the temperature formation here. Uh, several authors came out within a short time, 96 and 97, and proposed that the carbonates formed at high temperatures. And if true, that would weaken our hypothesis. Wouldn't invalidate it, but would certainly weaken it. And these papers were given very wide play in the media and at some scientific meetings. And it started something that we've been fighting ever since. It started the development of a consensus that we had been discredited because of the huge amount of publicity our critics got in answering uh, our <coughs> hypothesis. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong because we got a huge amount of publicity uh, when we first came out with the hypothesis, but there were many people that also got publicity because they seemed to contradict what we had said. Uh, but it turned out that within a few years, um, the, the uh, pendulum turned the other way toward low temperature origin, and in fact, uh, one group uh, did a complete 180 and came out with a, uh, although they had argued for high temperature, they wrote a paper uh, a couple years later that said, oh, low temperature is what it really was. So, uh, but the problem is that these reversals in the science didn't make the media and to some extent didn't make the scientific meetings with the splash that the original papers had. So even though uh, we were supported by all the later data, we were still <coughs> we were still tarred with the earlier papers, which turned out to be not correct. Uh, this is just some of the reason why, uh, why the temperatures were never very hot when the carbonates were formed. The oxygen isotopes, uh, once they were measured in detail, showed that they could not have been hot, the carbonates could not have been hot, or the isotopes would have entirely different patterns. The, uh, uh, the, in, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons will not take high temperatures. They, they degrade and disappear. Um, and the people that studied them said that based on, <coughs> on the structure of those paws, uh, the carbonates were never above a couple hundred degrees. Uh, and if, as I, get, uh, as I will get to in a moment, if the magnetites were formed by cooking the carbonates at high temperatures, um, the um, magnetites would be quite different from, from ones that we saw, and I'll talk about that. Um, so anyway, low temperature seems to be accepted. Uh, a lot of this story is in this book. I don't mean to plug this book necessarily, but some of you have seen it. And it's, it's a good example of, of how science works and, and how science and the media and the politics all intertwine. And uh, if you want to see uh, a case history, this is a good thing to look at. It's available from... Uh, uh, I, I guess from uh, Amazon. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is